Well, thank you, Galen, and looking forward to our, our discussion and certainly encourage questions during uh, my presentation as well as after. So hope it hopefully it would be a discussion. Uh, before we get started, I thought I'd just do two quick things. Uh, one of your options on that bar down at the below is a chat box. Uh, and that's one way you can enter questions if you'd like. I threw in uh, a link to my PowerPoint that I'm going to be using today. So if you'd like to download that PDF, uh, you're, you'd be welcome to do that and print it out if you want to keep notes or use it for whatever purposes you want. But it's there if you'd like. Uh, since we were uh, talking earlier about grading, um, I, I got this little slide here. I, every Wednesday morning, I get a, a group of uh, old time far side cartoons uh, in my inbox. And this one came up. I thought it was rather appropriate today. At least it made me chuckle. So I hope you uh, get a yuck or two out of it. <laughs> anyway, let's, uh, let's get on to something more important here. Or, uh, and that's manure. What, what could be more important than manure, right? <laughs> well, I, I guess maybe it's probably not top of many people's list of things they want to deal with. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of the money on the farm. But I, I think there's a, a discussion to be had with uh, uh, livestock owners, with feedlots, uh, about how we value manure. And uh, I think historically the term waste and manure have been pretty much associated with themselves. And I think it's probably one of the worst things that we ever did in terms of how we manage manure. It, it sends the wrong message. And so I'm going to spend 15, 20 minutes here trying to convince you that we need to transition. If we haven't already, our thinking of manure from a, being a waste product to a worth product. And so that will be the, the focus of today. Now, none of this is going to be rocket science. It's pretty simple stuff, but I, I think it's more related to how we value this product and how we think in terms of it being a resource. So let's uh, get started here. Um, I like to use this uh, uh, little illustration. Uh, this is one of those important tools you always need to have in the back of your po back pocket for those important times in life. Uh, manure. Uh, in the 16th and 1700s was uh, actually transported around Europe quite a bit, primarily by ship. That was the best way of transporting something of significant uh, volume. And they put it in uh, wooden crates and set it in these ships. And some of these ships leaked a little bit on occasion. And what happens when manure and uh, uh, gets wet, if you think about it, uh, if you, it, it produces a little bit of methane, and then the poor sailor that's the next one to go down to inspect the, the hull of the ship uh, with his uh, lantern uh, sets off a little explosion and ships sink and things like that. So as the story goes, and none of us really know if this is true, but we were, t we were told that on these crates that carried manure, they began putting the, the uh, sign stow high in transport. And possibly that is the origin of a, a word that I use a, a few times too often, uh, or at least the acronym uh, of stow high in transport. So whether that's true or not, I just thought that'd be a tool you want to have in your, in your back pocket. But now when I think in terms of when I use that word, I like to say, okay, I used it because I was thinking of manure as a resource, as a value and not as a waste product. So that's my excuse I use now. Hopefully you can use it too. Okay. All right. Um, Galen has taught me well over the years, whoops, I went too far there. I'll stop right here. Uh, about the, uh, the golden triangle that we have here in Nebraska and the interaction of the corn, the ethanol, and the cattle industry and the, the win-win that has resulted from the three uh, working together. And I, I think we all recognize that, that value. Well, there is a, a leg to this, so that I don't think we always think in terms of it's important to that value. And that's that leg between the animal and the corn and the, the flow of nutrients on that leg, the flow of manure. And if we are going to have a win in that leg, both from a dollar perspective and from a water quality perspective, we need to do two things. 
One is we need to make sure we're plugging the leaks of nutrients in that leg. And the regulations that we went through in the early 2000s, late 1990s, have been designed to make that happen, at least on our larger animal feeding operations. The, uh, the other thing that we always need to think in terms of is that we need to recognize if we're going to protect water quality and if we're going to get the greatest value out of that manure, we need to use that manure first before we import fertilizer from outside. So anytime we can recycle an existing nutrient within our system, rather than bringing in phosphorus from Florida or nitrogen from the Gulf Coast, that is a value both dollar-wise to the farmer, that's a realized product or outcome, and it's also a value for protecting water quality. So to make that third leg of this golden triangle work, I think we need to think in terms of these two things, and I'm gonna spend some time on this. Now, what I'd like to do is create a, a quick picture in your minds of how phosphorus moves in the landscape associated with a, a livestock feeding operation. So I'm gonna draw an arbitrary boundary around this cattle operation that's there in the middle, the feedlot there, and recognize that feedlot, or that operation manages both cattle and some production of, uh, of corn and other crops. Now, nutrients arrive on this farm, and I'm gonna look, talk primarily in terms of phosphorus today, keep it fairly simple but they arrive in these three forms as feed we purchase, animals we purchase, fertilizer that we may be bringing onto the farm. And it leaves that farm probably in one of these three pathways. At least that would be the outputs that would be desirable, animals, manure that we're exporting to a neighboring crop farm or crops. Now, if we were ad able to quantify those arrows in terms of the imports, compare it to the arrows that are the exports, that difference is an imbalance. And our ultimate goal in managing this livestock operation to both protect water quality and to get the peak economic value out of the manure is to make sure that imbalance is as close to zero as absolutely possible. In fact, if it was zero, that would be our, our, our ultimate goal. So that's kind of the challenge that we have. Now, there are two more flows. There are internal flows. There's the recirculation of nutrients, of phosphorus in this case, as feed and as manure used as fertilizer. And if we keep that recirculation, that recycling to be very efficient, then we use very little fertilizer, we import less feed and so, the efficiency of the overall operation is often determined by how efficiently we recycle internally. Now, in the early 2000s, we put in regulations that really asked us to focus on how efficiently are we using the manure in this system. So they focused on this red arrow. And the ultimate goal was that we would reduce the fertilizer import uh, purchases and improve our imbalance in that fashion. So that was the regulatory approach was to, to improve the efficiency of that flow in the process. Now I would suggest to you today that one of the challenges that we still have remaining is we have a lot of operations that need to export some of that manure and should they, it, does that apply to my individual operation? Am I enough out of balance that I should be exporting manure, and if so, how much is maybe the important questions. And what I'd like to do is just take you through a little sample problem for a feedlot, and I'm gonna put it all on the basis of a single cow and try to put some numbers on these, these arrows here today. So we'll start here, and our goal is to get this imbalance down to something very, very minimal. And I'm gonna keep this very simple. Uh, we're going to, okay, the imbalance is the important thing that we're trying to get to, make it close to zero. Now, the example, we'll, we'll pull in, we'll buy one yearling, we're going to sell one finished steer, and in terms of phosphorus, the numbers are listed there, 
uh, uh, for that animal coming in and leaving the farm. Now Galen designs a, a feed ration for that and he will probably put about 14 pounds of phosphorus through that animal during that finishing phase uh, to, to, to grow it out. Now where is that feed going to come from is the important question I would suggest to you. Okay, one other thing I'll put into this diagram. That animal is going to excrete about 11.8 pounds of phosphorus and we'll start off assuming it's all going to be recirculated internally. So the difference between the, what we fed and what that animal retained is actually the manure that's being excreted. Okay, so here's our diagram. Now the one missing piece of information is where is that feed phosphorus coming from? And let's start with this assumption. Let's assume 20% of that feed is imported, 80% is coming from in, inside the farm. Now, in this situation, we can recirculate most of the manure to grow out this feed because there's a pretty good balance between what's in the manure and, the, and in the feed. And in this case, focusing on that manure loop being recirculated within the farm probably will resolve our imbalance. And in this case, uh, it would be a very minimal imbalance, something we wouldn't likely worry about. So that works, but that 20% is kind of a break point. If I'm doing, if I'm purchasing feed at 20% or less of my total requirements for feeding the beef animal, I probably don't need to export manure. So let's change this scenario now. Let's assume we're growing less feed within our operation compared to its needs and we're buying more from outside. In this case, we'll reverse it. We'll buy 80% of our feed from outside. And so now this is what the magnitudes of these flows begin to look like. And if we calculate that imbalance for the imports minus the exports, this is the nine pounds of phosphorus that we have not accounted for. And I think we need to think of this from both a lost opportunity, that's nine pounds of phosphorus or roughly 21 pounds of potash that is not being used in the system or by crop farmers nearby. So that's roughly, just from a potash standpoint, that's roughly $10 of value per animal that we've lost. It's also nine pounds of phosphorus. It's adding to the water quality risk of this lake up here uh, near this farm and this stream that's flowing through this farm. So it's a water quality risk and it's a lost opportunity cost or lost opportunity value, I guess I would say, as part of this farm. So this farm, if it's gonna resolve its problem is most likely gonna look at changing what they retain in, inside the farm and export. And if it was to achieve a balance, it would need to export that nine pounds of manure phosphorus and only keep 2.9 in the farm to provide the needs for growing the feed. So this is the ideal. And we're back to our imbalance being zero in this case. So this farm definitely needs to export manure and it needs to export a fairly significant part of what it's bringing in. Uh, and that's important to realize if we don't move that manure off the farm, we lose value in terms of the phosphorus, also in terms of the nitrogen that we're not talking about or the potassium or the carbon. But there's a lost value and there's an environmental risk. So we don't have win-win until we export that manure. Now, what's the challenge in this picture? We've got to be a pretty good business person and we've got to be able to convince our neighboring crop farmers that that manure has value and that there's reason that they would want that manure from, from my feedlot. So let's, uh, uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about the value of the manure and some of the arguments I think we can reasonably use with neighboring crop farmers or even with some of our neighbors in town talk about what's that mount what's the value of this manure uh, 
I generally like to think in terms of three values that we can put maybe in some cases a dollar value on, some cases maybe just a, something a little harder to evaluate, but things that we can quantify to a certain extent, and that's the fertilizer substitution, the organic matter value, and then the possible increase in yield. Just going to share a little information about each of these three to give you a few thoughts to share if you're talking with the crop farmer or with the neighbor in town. In terms of the fertility benefit, we recognize there are nutrients in this, and I've listed some of those. Uh, they have dollar value. It's pretty easy to assign a dollar value, and we'll look at that. I guess we'll look at it right now. Here is the value of the manure. Uh, and, I, and this is for the feedlot manure, and I'm going to give you a range of values. The lower estimate, about $14 per ton, is for a situation based on, you know, roughly today's fertilizer value prices and no value for the potash being given. Uh, the high value is if we're in a soils and dealing with soils that are needing potash, or not, potassium, I'm sorry, uh, then we can add that value in. And it's probably a representative of more typical fertilizer prices over the last five years or so. So somewhere between that 14 and 32 ton dollars per ton. Now note where the value of that manure is. What do we have to really focus on if we're going to help that neighboring crop farmer find value from that manure? It's that yellow area. It's the phosphorus. And if that neighboring crop farm has fields that need potassium, then it's those fields in particular, the combination of phosphorus and potassium. There is some value in the nitrogen and the micronutrients, but they're relatively a minor part of this. So you begin to see why I've concentrated on phosphorus today. Always we're going to have to put value on that phosphorus, find situations that can utilize that phosphorus if that Manure is going to be treated as a value product rather than a, as a waste product. Okay, so now let's go back to our feedlot and ask which of these fields are the ones we're going to target for getting value out of that manure. And let me just give you a few of my rules of thumb here. We're first going to target those fields that are less than 20 parts per million phosphorus. And in most cases, when we apply feedlot manure, we're going to apply several years of phosphorus at once. And so we're also going to target those fields that haven't received manure in recent years. Uh, so probably the best way to know when to return to a field is to monitor that soil P level. And when it gets back to that less than 20 parts per million, then that manure phosphorus is going to have real value again. It's also worth looking at wheat fields in the region. Uh, wheat fields need a higher soil P level uh, than a corn or soybean field does. And so raising that for a neighboring crop farmer can be fairly expensive in terms of purchasing commercial fertilizer. Uh, it, it can be done probably more economically with, uh, with manure. So they also represent an opportunity for giving value to that manure. Uh, if those fields have been high yielding in terms of corn, probably more likely some of our, many of our irrigated fields, there's a possibility that potassium may be needed there. And if that can be added in, that, that's a big bonus. Nitrogen is also important. I always remind people we need to keep that in mind. It's probably a small part of the value, but we still want to conserve that nitrogen value, apply it ahead of crops that have non-legumes, because if we don't, we have run that risk that we're going to lose that nitrogen and make it a, an environmental risk. Uh, so treating it as a value is, is still important, even though its economic component may not be as much as the nitrogen and phosphorus. Okay. So that's our win-win opportunities from an agronomic standpoint. Okay. Uh, I'm going to suggest we uh, switch. Oh, just share a couple resources and I'll put a note up about these at the end. If you want to 
put a value on manure for your individual operation. We have a couple of tools. Uh, if you don't get those jotted down in time, you can just Google Nebraska manure value calculator and, and you'll get those tools coming up uh, in your, 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 uh, your Google screen. Okay. I'd like to switch to the organic value because I think this is a message that really is not being told uh, well uh, and uh, has not been accepted. Um, I remember that when I was six year old, years old, I, I heard my dad get a real tongue lashing from my grandfather. And it was the, the day my dad decided to give up raising livestock, raising cattle on our farm. And I've often wondered if the reason for that wasn't in part because my grandfather realized the value of that manure. And I'm sure there were other reasons too, but uh, um, uh, I think there was a generation prior to my generation, prior to my father's generation that really recognized this. And we've often forgot about this message. Um, uh, Andy Schulting shared this slide with me from Andy's from Nutrient Advisors, and if you'll read, this is a ISU, Iowa State University publication in 1907. And it states that manure permanently improves the soil. It also improves the physical properties of the soil and increases its water holding capacity and water absorbing capacity. Uh, I think you can see that at that time, manure may have been valued for its organic matter as much as its fertility value, and uh, something that maybe we need to also recognize. Uh, adding organic carbon, uh, organic matter to the soil has some real potential for improving the physical, the chemical, and the biological properties. I tend to focus primarily on the physical properties because that's what I understand as an engineer, and we'll share just a couple of thoughts on that here in a minute. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that value, that organic matter. <clears throat> I like to use this illustration to share one change that occurs in the physical properties in that soil resulting from organic matter. Of course, that soil or that manure provides organic matter to the soil. That organic matter is like food for the microorganisms in the soil. So what it does is it really ramps up very quickly that microbial activity that occurs in the soil. And there's some things that result from that that have some real benefit. It, the microbial activity produces a compound called polysaccharides. That creates the aggregates in the soil that are so, so valuable to a high quality soil. And what that means in terms of some of the physical properties, it means that soil infiltrates more water during a rainfall event or an irrigation event. It has less runoff and less erosion. And so that all has benefits in terms of the resiliency of that soil to drought, and it has value to the environment, less erosion getting into our waterways or runoff getting into our waterways. I'm just gonna share a quick sampling of information from two research projects. This was work done by Charles Shapiro and Charles Wartman at two different sites here in eastern Nebraska, comparing the increase in aggregates here on the vertical axis for manure, manure compost, and no manure, and then one, this other situation, manure, swine manure, and no manure. And you can see that the quantity of, or the increase in aggregates has been pretty significant in both of these circumstances. They learned that those aggregates form within the first two weeks of that manure application. And the other thing the study found is those aggregates remained in place throughout the entire growing season, what they've learned from that particular piece of research. Now, Charles Wartman did some additional work looking at uh, a manured site and what is the runoff and the erosion and the P loss from the site. And I'm gonna share just a couple of quick messages from that. Uh, this was done over an eight year period. The first three years they put manure on out of the crop or compost out of the crop. This was beef feedlot compost. 
And the last four cropping years, there was no manure added prior to the cropping season. And I'm going to share the results in terms of soil erosion and runoff. So in those three years that manure was applied, the erosion for the composted site and the runoff for the composted site is substantially less than the no compost site. We've reduced our erosion and our runoff by about two thirds by the application of compost on this site. Pretty significant benefit. You'll also note that that's a, in any one growing season, that was about a two inch reduction in water runoff. So that's two more inches of water in the soil. And through a growing season, two inches can often be very valuable from a uh, resiliency of, to drought situations. Now they also follow these fields, Charlie also followed these fields for the next four cropping seasons that and no manure is applied, but yet the sites that had received compost in 1999 through 2001 still showed the improved soil characteristics that led to lower soil erosion, lower runoff. So how often have we talked in terms of manure actually having an environmental benefit, less erosion, less runoff? Probably a story that's not been told very well. All right. So what are the opportunities for win-win? This situation, fields that are experiencing crusting or high runoff, fields that experience ponding and drowning out, manure applied over a period of time can eliminate, or I mean not eliminate, but reduce those challenges. Fields that have lower organic matter, or you notice lower biological activity, fewer earthworms, those would be some of those win-win situations we would be encouraging manure to target so that we can get the carbon or organic matter value out of that manure. Okay. Last slide that I'll share and then we'll wrap up for today. This is a piece of information I ran into just last week that had been very recently released. It's a work that was done by an Australian and a gentleman from China, or an individual from China. And it was a review of literature for 141 different studies worldwide looking at manure's potential substitution value for fertilizer. I'll just pull some things out of here that I thought were very interesting. It was 141 studies on average. There was a small increase in yield. Probably that's pretty typical what we see. And there's a lot of range for individual circumstances, but in general, that average yield increase is small. But take a look at what happened to the runoff and the erosion from these studies where that data was available. Less nitrogen in the runoff, less nitrogen being leached from those sites receiving manure. And why did that occur? Well, my guess is it's related to how we're storing nitrogen in this soil pool. A lot of nitrogen can get stored in the soil, and in this case, must we're adding a fair amount of nitrogen as what we call microbial bio, uh, biomass nitrogen, nitrogen stored in the microbes in the soil. So stable nitrogen, nitrogen that does not leach does not run off from the field. So you can see the environmental benefit. And then over here is the soil quality benefit. We're adding to that carbon pool and that's causing some of the, the other benefits from a yield, from a, uh, improvements in, 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 uh, in the environmental benefit that we've seen. So interesting summary that came out of this that I thought was worth sharing today. Okay, time to wrap this up. First, I think we need to recognize and help people recognize when we need to move manure off their feedlot and involve our neighboring crop producers in the use of manure. The win-win opportunity is if we can help realize the value of those nutrients as well as the win is a better protection of the environment uh, within that feedlot but we've got to export manure for many of our farms to do that. And anytime we're feeding more than 20% of the feed to the cattle coming from off farm sources, exporting manure 
is going to begin to be a, in a more and more important part of that, that solution. We need to help our neighboring crop farmers and even our neighbors in town understand these win-win opportunities. Manure has value. It has nutrient value, agronomic value. It has environmental value. And I think we need to begin recognizing that. Now, I know this is never a a win-win situation. There's always a, a gray area and there's some nuisance issues that we need to deal with and some economic issues uh, we're not gonna get into today, but we need to also be emphasizing these win-win opportunities. And my last message is the next time you let that um, stow high and transport term get out of your mouth, uh, you, you can think about it as talking about the resource value of, of manure. So Galen, that's where I'll end it up. Love to have questions if they are some. Type them into the chat box or turn your mute off and, and uh, share them with the, the group. Thanks, Rick. I've been, I've got the chat box open and there's nothing there. Are there any, uh, any questions or comments for Rick? I have one if no one does, but I'll wait and see if there are any others. Rick, uh, go ahead, somebody on. Okay, Rick, if not, uh, one of my questions would be in your value, was there any, the, the value you had up before of 14 to $32 per ton didn't have anything in there about organic matter and soil properties, right? It did not. Uh, that was strictly the, the fertility benefits that we could see from nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Any, any estimate of what that would contribute or is that in the works to try and, that seems like it'd be a difficult thing to quantify is the soil building property. You know, the, the yield boost that we see is probably due to that organic value. So we could add in, in situations where we're seeing a yield bump that into it. Um, but you know, that's variable from one situation to the next and one year to the next. So it, it becomes hard. I've never found a self-respecting economist that would try has tried to do that, that I'm aware of. Uh, and certainly you don't want this engineer doing that. I also um, asked, I was going to say that was paying attention today. I put up a little poll here. If anybody would uh, put in their answer, we'll see how we, if we learned anything today. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Galen. Well, I'll just say I'm not a self-respecting economist, so I don't mind doing it at all. Okay, please. So, Rick, uh, just to point out, uh, there's a question on the chat box from Rick Stilwell. Would similar benefits from composted manure be expected from as compared to stockpile manure? Mm -hmm. Good question, Rick. Uh, uh, yes, uh, and I think if we look at that first study I shared from uh, Shapiro and Wartman, you saw that the aggregate development for the uncomposted manure was equal to that of the composted manure. Actually, it was just a little bit better. And we even saw that in the swine manure, which is you know pretty dilute, uh, uh, you know we're talking 10 percent solids rather than 50 or 60% solids. Even that swine manure produced very similar benefits. So I, I, the answer to your question, Rick, is yes. Other questions before we- Yeah, Galen, can, uh, can you hear me? Yep. This is Kloffenstein. Rick, uh, just a, a comment about the import of phosphorus and you showed the golden triangle, and so that import of phosphorus becomes even more important when that corn has gone through the ethanol plant and the phosphorus got concentrated. So it gets to be uh, an, ad an additional issue. I don't know whether Erickson's giving you the right information on what's in the diet or not, but obviously that's, that's, that's a factor, right? And as you and I have discussed, uh, that's not a detriment to the distiller's grains. It just adds value to the manure. So 
comments would be welcome. And you, 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 your comment about Erickson's information was, was it correct that what he gave to me? Is that what you're saying, <laughs> Terry? Uh, yes, when we add, when we concentrate, uh, when, when we put corn through an ethanol plant, we're concentrating the phosphorus, we're often ending up with a diet higher in phosphorus than what the animal needs and more phosphorus in the manure. It probably creates some additional challenge if we're trying to squeeze our manure into a very small area, uh, maybe just the land that we own uh, within the feedlot. If we're trying to move that manure off farm to our neighboring crop farms, I, I agree with you, Terry, it's added value. It's given us more reason for that neighboring crop farmer to take advantage of that manure. Rick, this might not be directly related, but it seems like uh, based on how the, the requirements are for feed yards, there's quite an incentive to quote unquote market manure, uh, but, but many of those incentives are simply did, the, did someone else take it and apply it, right? Not that it's truly marketed at its highest value. So I guess a comment I would have, and, and then you can react to it is, is that we've not done a good job of marketing manure. We maybe have done a good job of moving manure off of the, off of the feed yard slash farm, but many times I find that's given it away. Any reaction to that or, or thoughts? I, I think that is our challenge ahead of us, Galen, is we, there's a, an important message to share about the value of that manure to that neighboring crop farmer and uh, would really encourage that we do a better job of marketing that. Uh, that should not be a, a, a loss for the feedlot. Uh, I, I think it should be considered a, a potential income stream, but that story I think has not been told well to those neighboring crop farms. Uh, they tend to want to buy a, a commercial fertilizer that uh, is sometimes a little more reliable in terms of what it might have in it uh, than the manure, but uh, I don't think that's, I don't think we've always provided the, the total story to that farmer, the neighboring crop farm. And I don't think we've told you know, the zoning board, county commissioners this story very well at all. You know, we still see a lot of decisions being made locally about manure, animals and manure because of the in concern with the the negatives aspects and I think the positives have not been told to those groups and I've I've always suggested that one of the maybe downsides from a feed yard perspective is that it's bulky but based on what you're saying that bulkiness quote unquote the organic materials might be a big benefit in other words you think about how bulky it is that it might not be a hindrance that might be one of the benefits you know, one of the things we've often done is composted manure and that burns up you know, third to a half of the carbon or third to the half of the organic matter and that's to me is a loss from a, you know, a soil perspective in some respects you don't have as much carbon there to, to feed that soil so um, yeah, I think you could make a point that uh, the raw manure uh, has, we don't want to lose that carbon value. Okay, if there aren't any other questions, uh, there's none other on the chat box. Anything about your poll results, Rick? Did they learn? Well, uh, we, I think we saw that people uh, were recognizing the, the bot value of the phosphorus in it and the importance of it. Uh, some One person also answered about the importance of the carbon, so I was glad to see that. I only gave you one option there. You probably should have given me two or three. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about some of the nuisance issues that we might have to deal with and what things we have to overcome. I was interested to see what people's take on that. It looks like one of the messages we're going to have to do a better job of selling to our neighboring farmers is just that predictability of nutrients available, and then you can see others that are high, highly ranked too. The last thing I put up here on the slide is um, is 
we would appreciate your feedback on these webinars and uh, Aaron has put together a, a very quick uh, survey she'd like you to take and I threw in some references if you would like to read more about any of the topics that were shared this morning. Okay, very good. Aaron, I uh, think we can stop the recording and uh, appreciate those that have been on. More importantly, uh, there'll be an opportunity to download this and view it on our YouTube channel. That can be accessed from our BEEF extension webpage, beef.unl.edu. And as Rick alluded to, at least for those on, he has uh, shared the Dropbox and you can get a PDF of the PowerPoint today, or I'm sure getting in touch with Rick, you'd be happy to share that with anybody that reaches out to you. Okay, thanks for joining. Our next webinar will be Wednesday, November 29th, uh, 1230, same place. And, uh, and uh, thanks for being on. Let us know if we can ever help.